Welcome to episode two of season two of Agricola Card of the Week. This week we're looking at Farmers of the Moor. Proudly sponsored by Yeoman. Available in the App Store now. Up until now I haven't mentioned Farmers of the Moor very much, but we almost always play with Farmers of the Moor. I think it rounds out the game, it balances the game, and it makes for a much better experience. Uh, it's a little bit like if I was going to play Settlers of Catan, it would be with Seafarers. If I'm going to play Trains, I'm going to have the Rising Sun and the base game together. Uh, if I'm going to play Alumbra, it's going to include at least three or four modules. Uh, very rarely am I playing just the basic game anymore. Farmers of the Moor makes the game different in several ways. One is that your farm is a little bit different every time. You uh, start out with one of these Moor cards, which is going to show how your farm is laid out, and you're going to have areas of peat bogs and forests that you're going to have to clear out the way in order to build your farm. So it gets rid of that sort of tyranny of just looking at the very same open board every single time you play. It adds some variety from the very first turn. You're going to have some extra what's called special action cards and depending on the number of players there's different ones but what that's actually going to do is it's going to give you some of the opportunities to clear out the forests and dig up some of those peat bogs uh, as well as do some extra things like build some extra minor or major improvements maybe get some extra food or get a horse which is another addition in farmers of the moor Essentially these are extra actions that you may be able to take on your turn uh, and you actually take that action by taking that card off the board and putting it in front of you. Uh, later on somebody could actually use that card by paying two food to the bank uh, to, to be able to do it but then they put it face down so it can only be used effectively twice although to be fair it's pretty unusual that you're used more than once in a game but later on when you've got a lot of food they can be used. The biggest change with the uh, Farmers of the Moor is that you're having to heat your home. Uh, so one of the things you'll have on your farm to begin with are the peat bogs and you can dig them up and use them for fuel. You can also trade wood for fuel in the same way that you would trade a wheat or a vegetable for one food uh, in the basic game. You can always trade one wood for a fuel. Each harvest you're going to have to heat your home. Uh, there are, it costs you one fuel per room but if you upgrade to a clay house or a stone house you can mitigate that or you can also get improvements that help you with heating your home. It's not, as more, it's not that much more complicated as it might sound. Um, it is another thing to manage, but there are other actions that help to mitigate that and obviously improvements as well. There are a series of major improvements in addition to the basic major improvements, things that help you heat your, heat your home, uh, things that assist with clearing, uh, getting more wood when you clear your forest or more peat when you dig up your peat bogs. Uh, and there are some additional things like the furniture stall and the ceramic stall, which lets you trade wood or clay respectively for other resources. So for me, Farmers of the Moor makes the game better for several reasons. One is that uh, because you're starting with a board that is quite different each time, uh, the, the outcome of the game is going to be a lot more different. Because you're not just starting with a blank slate, you're having to decide you know, where you're going to start building your pastures, where you're going to start playing fields, um, the order in which you're going to build your house out is going to depend a bit on where you have room. And in fact, one of the setups, uh, your house is completely boarded in by moors and forests and you can't even build your house before you started to clear those out. Uh, sometimes you will end the game with everything cleared out, just as if you started with a blank slate. And sometimes you're going to find you have a few of those farms or moors just still left on the, on the board. As long as they're on the board, that does not count as an unused space. Obviously, you're not getting points for having a pasture or a, a field, but it does... Um, it does count as used, so it's, it's sometimes towards the end you're thinking, well, do I need that wood that I'll get if I chop that forest down, or would I be better leaving that, and then that's not going to be an empty space. Which brings me to more wood. Um, the uh, You have bits of forest on your farm, and you get to chop those down, and ordinarily you get two bits of wood for each of those. You do that by using these extra special action cards. Uh, one of the special actions on those cards will be to chop down one of those uh, forests and, and you get two wood for that. Being able to sometimes just get a couple of extra wood to build out a minor improvement or to build an extra stable or something can be really handy. I really do like that aspect. Because you're having to heat your home uh, each harvest, there's a disincentive to growing your home too big too early and there's an incentive to upgrading your house. As I said earlier, uh, for each room you have to pay one fuel to heat your home. 
If you have a clay house, you subtract one from the total number of uh, fuel you need, and if you have a stone house, you subtract two. Uh, it is possible to have a two-room stone house, therefore that you do not have to heat it at all, and that's not a usual thing, but I have played that strategy a few times where I've been able to do family growth other ways and, uh, and just have a house that I didn't have to heat at all. Growing your family with Farmers of the Moor is much more measured. It's much more, okay, do I really want to be building out my house now when the harvest is coming, I'm going to have to heat that home without the benefit of the extra worker. Uh, you sort of really only want to build your house out when you're going to then be able to put a person in that room. Uh, it gives you an incentive to upgrade your house, so really upgrading to a clay house pretty early on. It's not unusual in our games to have a, have a three-room house upgraded to clay or even upgraded to stone. Um, we tend to get towards the end of the game more with three or four room houses than with five, which you might do if that wasn't such a concern. The game just is a little bit more measured in how you grow your family and I actually do like that a lot. The way these action cards work are quite interesting and I think they help to mitigate uh, turn order a little bit and that's another reason why I think Farms of the War is better. So when the first player is starting the new round they're going to be thinking, well if I grab a one of those cards that's an extra action for this turn, but uh, if I don't get my occupation or whatever it is I'm trying to do, then other people are going to grab that spot. And I think it means that people that are further down the turn order are more likely to have open space on the board to do those sorts of things like get, a, and get an occupation out early, where if you've ever been second or third player in a game and you're in the third or fourth round and you've just not been able to get an occupation out, uh, I think you might find that these cards do help mitigate that a bit. And finally, we have a new type of animal, the horses. Uh, these are you know, not really all that good for food, but they are worth one point each and they do breed just like other animals. Uh, you can turn them into food. There are improvements that allow you to do that. It's not something that you can normally do with just the normal fireplace, but it can be done. They're not great for food, but that's usually not why you're building horses because they're worth a point each and potentially you could get them before the first harvest and breed them every round. You could get quite a lot of points if you wanted to play that strategy and that, that would help to mitigate uh, some of the negative points you might get uh, if you didn't have certain types of animals on your farm, for example. There are some minor improvements and other things which work with horses, require you to have horses or give you bonuses to help you to get horses. Horses are acquired through the special actions. It's one of the special actions you would take. Uh, they may or may not cost you food depending on how many people there are in the game, um, but it's another way to get points and can provide you with an interesting strategy. If I have one criticism of Farmers of the Moor, it's the cards. Funnily enough, I do like the cards in Agricola, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, the, it's the cards that I'm not a big fan of. Uh, we actually even took 10 of them out of the deck permanently because they were either too convoluted or too expensive for the benefit that they gave you. It's not to say that there aren't some good cards, and I will be going through those in a moment. Um, but as I said in last episode, uh, we only usually deal out three of these when we're doing a 10 minus 3 draw of cards. Uh, the instructions say to deal out four of these and then three of the other minor improvements. Uh, even when we're doing a 10 minus 3 draw, I still think four cards out of those 10 cards is too many. I think three is plenty, and personally I would rarely take more than one of those into my hands. If I'm going to be discarding three cards out of my 10 card uh, draw, I typically I'm going to be, at least two of those are going to be Farmers of the Moor cards. It's not to say there aren't some great cards in there, there's certainly a lot of them. Personally I would have preferred to have uh, taken a lot more of them out of the deck. I think that the ones that remain would have been better, uh, but you know, this is somewhat of a democracy and uh, uh, for my gaming group we discussed which ones we would take out and we all we, we agreed on 10 of them, so uh, that's, that's improvement better than, better than nothing at all. Uh, as I said, I'm going to go through 10 cards. The Stone Wagon, a nice simple card, um, costs you two wood, no prerequisites. Uh, whenever you use the day labour action space, you receive an additional stone. Fairly simple, not even really relevant to the rest of the farmers of the moor, just a nice good card. The Spinning Mill uh, costs two wood and two clay. You have to have a sheep, uh, it is worth two points. Uh, for every two sheep you have in the field phase of each harvest, you pay one less fuel to heat your home. So basically you're using sheep to get their wool and uh, not have to spend as much to heat your home. Uh, obviously that is more tied into the whole Farmers of the Moor thing. Um, I really like this card. Whenever I get this, I try to get it out as soon as I can. The Forest Hut. 
It costs you two wood, but it is worth a point. You basically place a guest marker on one of the forest tiles on the board, and when you chop down those trees for wood, you then get that marker to use as an extra person to play an action in that turn. Nice simple card. Uh, if it wasn't worth a point, I probably wouldn't bother, but it is uh, sometimes a way of getting an extra action, especially if you're doing like a family growth and you're just playing an extra minor improvement there uh, just to give you an extra action at some point later in the game. Not a bad card at all. Reforestation. Uh, it doesn't cost anything, but you do have to have three major improvements out, and this is the sort of thing that's typical of the Farms of the Moor deck, that the prerequisites on the cards are often quite a high bar to jump over. Essentially, this allows you to put a forest tile from the supply back on your board, so it's a way of getting more forest, which could be handy. You could then chop it down and get more wood, um, or you could get a bonus point if you have the Forester's Lodge, which gives you bonus points at the end of the game if you've still got forest on the board. The Willow Bank. Uh, is basically a way of getting extra read. Again, you have to have a major improvement before you can play this card, but otherwise it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, whenever you use one of the special action cards to chop the trees down on your farm, you also get an additional read. It's a nice basic card, very useful, uh, would often come out in a game if someone has it in their drawer. The next two I'm looking at together are the uh, more enclosures and the farm extension. These are actually additional spaces for your farm. Um, so potentially you could have an extra four spaces to put pasture or to, to plow fields or whatever else. I have had these come up in a drawer. I've never actually managed to get one out. At the end, they are each worth a point, but like any empty space on your farm, if you haven't used that at the end of the game, you're losing points. And I've never been in that position of thinking, Yes, I think I can use extra space on my farm and also uh, you know, not lose points at the end because I'm going to make sure I make use of them. Still, an interesting addition. I like having them in the deck, even if I've never actually played them or seen them played in a game. The Homewood. Uh, this allows you to keep any one animal on any forest space. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, but you have to have played three improvements. Again, this is a bar to sort of jump over. Um, the, I've used this to do horses, so I've actually used this to get horses on the go before the first harvest um, because it specifically says no sheep, so and I think that balances it out a little bit because if you could just get sheep before the first harvest and start breeding those sheep without having to build any fences, it would be kind of quite unfair, but there's nothing to stop you from getting horses and start to breed them, and if you can get a couple of horses before the first harvest and breed them, in, you get one. that's one point, and if you can do that every time through the game, obviously you're going to have to build more space out for them, but you know, you can start generating points early on in the game if you want to do that strategy or if you've got some other improvement or that, that it requires you to have horses. The family burial plot is uh, basically comes with a little token that you put on the board. Uh, I have used it once. Uh, it costs you a stone and you have to have a stone house. Uh, but basically you're putting a little memorial uh, crypt on your farm. Um, it counts as used. And it's worth an additional bonus point at the end of the game. I don't know why they didn't just say put two points on the card, because really it's worth two points. Um, but nonetheless, it's two points. It's one space that's not empty. So you're getting towards the end of the game and you're thinking, mm, you know, I'm trying to make sure I don't have any empty spaces to get those negative points. It's a, it's a nice, easy way. To... And finally, the advanced payment. Uh, I've used this a few times. It's minus four points. But you get a fuel, a food, a wood, a clay, a reed, a stone, a sheep, and a grain. Um, obviously, getting that out really early, getting grain, be able to get that on the go, getting that extra sheep that you might need to form a breeding pair. It's a little bit like the collector that I discussed in the very first episode. You're trading points now for resources. I believe that you're almost always going to make up those four points. Other than the fuel, it's a card that could be used in any game and uh, a nice, basic, simple card that I really like. So I'd just like to finish off with some tips for uh, helping with Farmers of the Moor, how we play. There's something that might just be some little tips and tricks for your game. Uh, one thing we do is when we do a forest uh, fell trees or a um, cut peat, which is the action where you take the peat off and turn it into fuel, uh, we just take the tile off the board and then that tile is treated as either two wood or two peat respectively. Uh, we were doing this uh, before we got some extra wood tokens, especially we were finding that we were often actually running out of wood, wood tokens um, especially with like felling trees and you know that's too wood you can you can run out of the, the 20 something odd wood tokens that come with the basic game um, so rather than doing that back and forth every time someone fells trees or cut peat we just basically take that put it with our other resources and it counts as a two token
Another thing we do is we keep all the major improvements all together in an ordered stack. With Farmers of the Moor you have one new major improvement for each major improvement that's in the base game plus a couple of extra that sit on, onto the side. So under the fireplace there's a slaughterhouse, under the cooking hearth there's a cookhouse etc. We just keep them all in order like that so that when we're setting up a game we just lay them out uh, and then when we pack up obviously that's done in reverse order. Uh, even if we are playing just the base game we still just set them out and everyone's under the understanding that uh, they're only buying the top improvements, the other ones aren't really there but we just always keep our game set up that way. The expansion also comes with two decks of minor improvements but no occupations. Uh, there's an E deck and an F deck for the minor improvements. Uh, on the back of the cards it's a different uh, graphic than the ones that come with the expansions and, and the base game for the minor improvements. For our game we just decided to shuffle them all in together after playing a few times. There's not really a huge amount of difference and if you're up to the point of playing Farmers of the Moor expansion anyway, you're after a more advanced game I think than just the basic game. Uh, although it's not really that much harder but I do think that you know, you're at the point where you're deciding which cards are worthwhile and which ones are going to fit into a strategy so we may as well just make it easy on us and shuffle them all in so we really only have one Farmers of the Moor deck. There are a few different variations in what they call difficulty levels mentioned in the rules. Uh, I'm going to keep it really simple and say that there's really only two options there that you should be using. One is a really basic family game. If you want to play the family game and add Farmers of the Moor you can certainly do that. You have no minor improvements, no occupations, just the major improvements and the actions on the board. You'll have the special action card and you'll start off with your forests and your peat bogs on your farm. Uh, and then the other variation would be just where you play with occupations and minor improvements as you normally would. The only difference is going to be you're going to mix in some of these Farmers of the more minor improvements and you're going to have the Farmers of the more major improvements. Otherwise, everything's as discussed here before. I would disregard completely any of the other variations and either pick the very basic family game or the normal regular full game just with the addition of Farmers of the more. Proudly sponsored by Yeoman. Available in the App Store now. So thank you for watching this episode. Uh, I really do like Farmers of the Moor. We got it fairly soon after getting the basic game and I really do think it rounds it out. That, that, that notion of not growing your house too quickly, too early, keeping that in check, balancing that out between the players, giving you those extra actions, that extra wood, uh, more than makes up for the having to heat your home each harvest. That is really not that big a burden. It doesn't make the game that much more complicated. And if anything, I think that it is just a more well-rounded experience. So anyone who's played the basic game with the, the I deck, the K deck, or any of the other sort of expansion decks, Anyone who's played enough board games to know how to sequence things together uh, was certainly going to be able to cope with that extra step of having to have some peat at the end of each harvest to, um, to heat your home. If you run iOS, please consider supporting the show by purchasing my app, The Omen, uh, which is the easiest way to score the game. It includes uh, section for horses and also for the rule about having sick workers at the end being not worth as many points. We use it every time we play. Uh, please like or leave a comment below and subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Welcome to Season 2 of Agricola Card of the Week. The World Championship deck strikes a nice balance between sort of utilitarianism and kind of novelty. Proudly sponsored by Yeoman. Available in the App Store now.